everyone here this evening to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, study His Holy Word together. I appreciate the good songs of my brother Ralph and my brother Philip this morning and good prayers that have been prayed today. It's always good to sing and pray, isn't it? That's what Paul and Silas were doing in the jail in Philippi in Acts 16.25. The Lord willing, our my plans are to go to the Philippines in October for a couple of weeks. And uh, Brother Paul Curlis, he wants to go too. So it would be very fine to have him along. So please pray for us and that effort as we endeavor to go labor with the brethren there at Galamuya and Pogapud in northern Philippines. And also, uh, we look forward to our gospel meeting here coming up in July, July the 10th and 13th, Brother Lee Moses, Brother Moses of the Berea Church of Christ near Union City, Tennessee. Brother Moses is a very faithful and sound preacher, and I can say a godly man. So thank you for him and his precious family. Look forward to them being with us. This evening, we want to talk about something that, of course, is uh, very controversial and there's a lot of disagreement over, and that's the Holy Spirit. You know, one reason that there's so much controversy and disagreement is because people really don't understand who the Holy Spirit is and how He works. Some think, well, He's just a feeling out there floating around. He's just a thing. The Spirit hits you. That's the way they feel. Well, you know, the Spirit hit me. But actually, the Holy Spirit is a person. When you go to Acts chapter 13, and here before the first missionary journey that Saul, that is Paul and Barnabas, embarked upon, we know that in Acts 13 and verse 2, and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, this is the Holy Spirit talking here, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein do I have called them. When Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, you know what Peter said? You have not lied unto men, but unto God. There in Acts chapter 5. He is a person. He is a divine person. There's only one Godhead. There's only one God, but there are three divine persons making up the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We remember that Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. There in Matthew 28, 19. We know that the Holy Spirit is listed together with the Father and the Son at the end of the book of 2 Corinthians. And thus he is a member of the Godhead 3. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. A lot of people are, don't understand how the Holy Spirit works. They think that He operates directly upon man. But this evening we will endeavor to show for a little while that the Spirit works through the Word of God. That's the only way that He works upon the heart of man is through the Word of God. We're going to show that this evening. Does the Holy Spirit work through the Word of God upon man's heart? We looked at that question. Or, in contrast to that, does the Holy Spirit work separate from the Word of God upon man's heart? And we know we've got people now rising up teaching that, not just in the denomination <coughs> world, but even among our brethren. A friend of mine, and a brother Ralph also, <coughs> Brother Jerry Brewer, sent this out about the Affirming the Faith Seminar to take place in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I'm glad that not all the brethren in Oklahoma are going along with this. But in the Affirming the Faith Seminar in 2016, the speaker biographies, and I'm not going to go into all of them, I will say, though, there are some men on the program that at least in the past have reported to be very sound. Well, now they're going along with compromisers and those who are not sound, and therefore they're no longer sound when they compromise on the fellowship issues. But look at this biography here. I hope you can read this. I tried to get it where we could see it. Arnelius Crenshaw, Jr. is a minister and evangelist of the Northeast Church of Christ. He has partnered with the Holy Spirit 
in serving the Northeast Church for more than 30 years. And this is a quote now. I'm not saying this myself. He oversees the Central Urban Development Inc. Incorporated, a 501c3 community development corporation which serves as a vehicle to carry out his vision of ministry. So here we have a 501c3 organization to carry out his ministry. Well, what do you think about that? Did the Holy Spirit lead him to do that? Brother Crenshaw, it says, serves as chairman of the board of Central Urban, which developed a $6.3 million, 32-unit affordable housing addition in the historical John F. Kennedy neighborhood of Oklahoma City, etc. And, of course, uh, on, the, on the biography, it talks about improvements and changes that were made and all that. Well, as gospel preachers and members of the Lord's Church, needed and real change is wrought by the gospel of Christ. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. That's what gospel preachers need to be doing, spreading the gospel. Unauthorized practices and confusion on the Spirit. I'm not going to get into a lot of this organization he's involved in, but just look at an example here of how brethren are getting off into things where they ought not to be. The organization, Central Urban, is a social gospel effort. Brother Jerry Burr, the gospel preacher of the Northeast Church of Christ in Elk City, Oklahoma, states. And I believe he's right about that. It is not spiritual work that God has authorized. Cornelius Crenshaw claims, quote, he has partnered with the Holy Spirit in serving the Northeast Church. What is a partner? Now, I'm not going to get into homosexual partners and all that. That's not what this talking about. But we know people do refer to homosexuals and their partners and all that. But commonly, as we know, throughout the years, a partner is one who shares or associates with you in an effort a uh, partner is looked upon as one who is an equal, one that uh, you're working with, like partners in the business or some other effort. According to dictionary.com, a sharer and an associate. Now I realize that the Bible speaks of brethren being laborers together with God, 1 Corinthians 3 9, and working together with God, 2 Corinthians 6 1. That's scriptural. But that doesn't mean that he's not our partner in the sense that he's sharing with us and we're associates with him because the Godhead is superior to man. Jesus Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. And he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. And so here we see the superiority of the Godhead over man. And certainly we labor together with God, and we do God's will. There's no joint decisions to be made or uh, co-laboring together in the sense of equals when it comes to working with God. We're doing His will, and He blesses us when we do Brother Brewer aptly states, I wonder how that partnership with the Holy Spirit is working out. Which is the senior partner? Or is it a 50-50 deal? What does each partner bring to the table? There's some interesting questions there, isn't it? I think, of course, obviously, Brother Brewer, as he was good at, is speaking in obvious irony there, certainly showing the folly of such a statement that one is a partner with the Holy Spirit. Did the Holy Spirit guide Crenshaw in this urban development effort? Did the Holy Spirit tell him to do that? But the only way the Holy Spirit's going to guide us is through the authority of God's Word that He has given 
God's Word. We're to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus by His authority, Colossians 3, 17. It's through the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, that we are instructed according to Ephesians 6, 17. So we have the Word of God to instruct us. Now, tonight, I'd like to look at a quote here by Brother Gus Nichols, the late Brother Nichols from Alabama. He makes a good quote here. To be born of the Spirit, John 3, 8, one must be led by the Spirit. When a man has been led by the Spirit of God, he is a son of God. He is a child of God. The Holy Spirit's work in the process of the new birth is defined as leading us which he does through the inspired word he revealed. Amen, Brother Nichols. Those who follow as the Spirit guides have the new birth or are born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit then makes us children of God. There is no controversy about that, I presume, among any of us. Very good quote. We know here in Romans 8th chapter, verse number 14, Paul speaks of being led of the Spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We remember that Jesus said to Nicodemus, who came to him by night in John chapter 3, he said, Verily, <clears throat> verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But then Nicodemus didn't understand, well, how is a man born again? He didn't understand that. Verse number 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. One, of course, is born of water when he's baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 27, like the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts 8, 38 and 39. And he is born of the Spirit when he submits to the teaching of the Word of God, the seed, the Word of God, Luke 8, 11, which is the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 17. So this is the new birth, not the new births. This is one birth when one submits to the teaching of the Spirit for the Gospel and obeys it and is baptized in Christ. He becomes a new creature and is born again. We know that Peter speaks of those who preach the Gospel with the Holy Spirit Brought down from heaven, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. He said, He speaks of them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire looked into. In 1 Corinthians 2, 13, regarding the apostles and other inspired men, we speak with the words which the Holy Ghost teaches. And again, the Spirit guides, the guided the inspired men in the words they employ. In John 16, before Jesus died on the cross and later went back to heaven, he promised the apostles, the twelve, the coming of the Spirit. In John 16, 13, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So the Spirit would guide them and they would record what they were guided in being taught by the Spirit. Now, I'm going to look at this chart here, and I believe I'm not going to continue on beyond this page tonight because we have a lot of Scripture here. I'm going to go through these. So I'm going to perhaps finish the rest of it at another time. But let's look at this, and I believe this will prove conclusively that the Spirit does in sanctification what the Word of God does. What the Holy Spirit does, the Word of God does. The man, as far as sanctifying, saving his soul, and guiding him. Let's look at this. It's very, very plain. The Holy Spirit, He instructs Nehemiah 9.30, and you can be turning over there if you like. What does the Word of God do? He instructs us. Go back to the book of Nehemiah, the ninth chapter, verse number 30. <clears throat> Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testifiest against them by thy spirit and thy prophets. Speaking to God here, 
Yet would they not give ear, therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the land. So back then, God instructed the people by His Holy Spirit through the prophets. And we know that from 2 Peter 1 21. That holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God has always been interested in teaching and instructing man because He cares about man. He knows that man needs instruction. Then we go to 2 Timothy 3, 16 17. We see that the Word of God instructs. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is complete, really furnished under every good work. So how does the Holy Spirit guide and instruct us today? Through this book, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. Now let's move on. The Spirit sanctifies. That is, the Spirit sets man apart, separates man from ungodliness, and makes him holy, sanctified unto God. The Spirit makes saints. And that's what it is to be sanctified. It is to be a saint. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the Spirit through obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Peter says, but what does the Word of God do? Now we learn here from Peter that the Spirit sanctifies. It's very plain. As we look at that passage, let me read it again. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, gracing you in peace be multiplied. The Spirit sanctifies man. But you know, in the denominational world, they have a completely different view. But you know, the Spirit moves you and He touches you directly and you're sanctified. You're saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus in praying to the Heavenly Father in John 17, pray to the Father. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How would they be sanctified? Through the word of God, which is the truth. What is the Holy Spirit called there in the book of John? He is called the Spirit of truth. And he would guide the apostles into all truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. So, how and when does the Spirit sanctify man? When man obeys the gospel of Christ, he becomes sanctified. He then belongs to God. He is brought out of sin and unto God. He becomes a Christian. And by the way, we continue in that state as we continue in obedience to the Word of God, which the Spirit brought down from heaven. So, the Spirit sanctifies, the Word of God sanctifies. We know here in John 14, verse 26, that the Spirit would teach the apostles. I'd like to go back to the book of John again. Jesus said, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, and the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. We know that earlier Jesus has said to them, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. The Lord had many things He wanted them to know, but they were not ready to receive these things. They could not bear them at that time. But after He went back to heaven and prayed the Father and sent the Holy Spirit, according to John chapter 14, verse 16, the Holy Spirit came on the apostles, beginning in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, after the Lord's ascension and when the church began, and then he began to guide the apostles into all truth, and he taught them. Now there are those today who would maintain, well, the Spirit is my teacher. The Spirit teaches me. Well, does the Spirit teach us directly? I've uh, studied the Bible many years in my preaching. I've never uh, professed to be able to get up and preach without some preparation. I know sometimes we have to get up, don't we, Brother Ralph? And Brother Philip, I'm sure, has done this. We have to get up impromptu in an emergency situation and preach. But we rely on things that we studied somewhere down the line. We had to prepare for that day. We had to prepare for that event. We have to study. 
But sometimes you hear a preacher say, well, I got up to preach and the Spirit led me. He just told me what to say. Do you think that happens today? No. Because we don't have inspired men, men miraculously guided by the Spirit today, like the apostles were. We know in John chapter 6 that even in olden times, people were taught by the Word of God, John 6, 45. Jesus said, It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. So, man is taught of God. Obviously, we can't learn without being taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Well, how is man taught by God? What does Romans 10, 17 say? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You know, earlier in that passage, Paul said, how shall they hear without a preacher? So obviously, the Lord expected the church then as today to preach the gospel. And that's the way people hear the Word of God and come to faith. We know that the Holy Spirit begets, going back to John 3, 5 again. We talked about that earlier. Jesus was talking to nighttime Nicodemus. Very, very, I say to thee, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. One is born of the Spirit of God and of the water. Again, when one submits to the teaching of the Spirit and he obeys the gospel, he is born again. He becomes a new creature. He is born again of new birth. Uh, I heard a preacher one time he was talking about a woman bringing a child in the world. When the water breaks, the child comes forth. Well, when we come up out of that water, we're a child of God, aren't we? If we have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. But how does the Spirit beget? Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. <clears throat> Paul here, writing to the church of Corinth, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul claimed that he had begotten these brethren. In Acts chapter 18, he came to Corinth, this great wicked port city, and he converted many souls to Christ. We read in verse 8, And many of the Corinthians, hearing, <coughs> believed, and were baptized. But Paul was simply the instrument through which they were begotten. God actually begot them. The Spirit begot them, but it was through the gospel. In James chapter 1, verse 18, James teaches basically the same thing concerning man's begot or being born again into Jesus Christ. He said there, of his own will, speaking of the Father. You see here it says the Father begat them. Well, remember that the Godhead are working together to save man. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So, God begets man through the word of truth, the gospel. But also, the Holy Spirit converts the soul of man. I'd like to read here from uh, John chapter 16. I'm going to read the American Standard Version. The King James is perfectly good too. But John 16 verse 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him unto you. And he, when he has come, will convict the world in respect of sin. King James says, reprove. The American standard says, convict. And of righteousness and of judgment. Well, the Spirit convicts man. Man certainly cannot be converted to Christ without being reproved and convicted. But we learn back in Psalms that the Word of God converts man. The Word of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise. The simple. We know that the Spirit leads man. We read that a while ago. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. But what does God's Word do? 
You remember that when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, He led them by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. We can use that as a type or an analogy there. How does God lead us through this whole world of sin, through this wilderness we're traveling through, trying to make it to heavenly Canaan, the promised land of heaven? It's through God's Word. That's how He does it. He's never done it any other way. In Psalm 119, 105, David said, Thy Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We know that Paul prayed that the Ephesian brethren, of course this prayer will apply to any Christian. He said in verse 16, Ephesians 3, 16, that he, that is God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So the spirit strengthens man. There's no doubt about that. That's what Paul prayed. We go back to Deuteronomy chapter 11 in verse 8. Though we see that the Word of God strengthens man. There are those teaching today that the Spirit operates directly on man's heart and his inner being and strengthens him directly apart from the Word of God. That's false doctrine. In Deuteronomy 11 and verse 8, Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that ye may be strong, and go in and possess the land whither you go to possess it. So in obeying, obeying the commandments of the Lord, they would be strong. So let's go to the New Testament. Acts 20, verse 32. Paul said to the Ephesian elders, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance with all them which are saved. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two of the sword, pierced, given, divided, sundered, and sown, and spirit of the joints of the power. And as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, Ephesians, Hebrews 4, 12. Now you tell me that the word of God doesn't give strength and power to a person? Yes, the spirit empowers us, but it's through the word of God. All powerful word of God. The Holy Spirit comforts. Let's go to Acts. Chapter 9, verse 31, where we read of the comfort of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 9, verse 31, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, they were built up, they were strengthened. And walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. They were walking in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comforts. But we know that the Spirit guides and comforts man through the Word. We go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and verse 18. Here Paul is speaking about the second coming of Christ. There were some who were troubled that they thought that those that already died in Christ would be left out when the Lord comes back. But He comforts them in this passage. In verse 18, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. We comfort people with the Bible. And I know uh, this week I think about that, our beloved sister in Christ, Sister Joanne. Uh, I bring that out because she was faithful to the Lord and because so many in her family, uh, those here Central, they love the Lord and they love His Word like she did. I know they have found great comfort through the promises of God and His Word. But the Spirit comforts us through the Word in many ways, not just in grief over a lost loved one, but there are many ways. It gives us hope in all kinds of trouble. In Romans 15, 4, For whatsoever things are written aforetime are written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort in the Scriptures, might have hope. Beloved friends, the Word of God comforts us as nothing else can do. It helps us along this old rugged road of life. Then number nine, the Spirit convicts. We know that what we read a while ago in John 16, verse 7 and 8, where Jesus said in that passage, verse number 8, And when He has come, He will reprove, that is, convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. 
We know also that faithful brethren are to convict others by holding fast to the Word of God. In Titus chapter 1 and verse number 9, holding fast the faithful Word as he hath been taught. This is talking specifically about elders. Of course, the principle that faithful brethren can convict others by the Word of God is a sound principle. That he may be able by a sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, that is, to convict them of their error and to lead them out of their error to the truth. The Holy Spirit washes. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 11. Paul writing to the brethren of Corinth, And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now someone might say, well, I thought the blood of Christ washed me. It's true, the blood of Christ does wash us. But how do we become justified and washed apart from the work of the Holy Spirit through the gospel? And we obey the gospel. When did Saul become washed in the blood of the Lamb? Acts 22, 16. And now why tearest thou rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? And from Acts 9 we learn that he arose forthwith, that is straightway, and he was baptized. We know also that we continue to be washed as we walk in the light. If we walk in the light of Jesus' life, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. But we have to keep His commandments to walk in the light. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. The Word washes. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Referring to Christ. I'm going to read 25 with it. Husbands, love your wife even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The church is under consideration here as well as the husband and wife relationship. Now speaking of Christ and the church, he said in verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. By the washing of water by the word. When we obey the word of God, we are washed according to this passage. The Spirit gives love. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The love of God. But in obeying the Word of God, we see that the Word gives love. And this is the way that we give love by obeying the Word. 1 John 2, 5. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. The number 12. The Spirit saves. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 6, 11 again. That we read a while ago. Paul said concerning the Corinthians who came out of sin and unto Christ, and such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So when a person is sanctified and they're justified, they're saved. We often teach that the blood of Christ saves man. It does. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. So when man is justified, he is saved. And the Spirit certainly is a part of our salvation. That's what Paul teaches here. But go to Acts chapter 11 and verse 14. This, of course, uh, has to do with the house of Cornelius. And it has to do with the message that was given to Cornelius to send men to Joppa and to call for Simon. His surname is Peter, verse 13. 
Verse 14, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Now friends, tell me one thing tonight that Peter told them regarding salvation that we were not told when we obeyed the gospel. Not one single thing. Today we are saved by the same words that the house of Cornelius was saved by. Because we have the same gospel. There's only one faith, which has been once for all delivered to the saints. Jude verse 3. We are saved by the same words. Yes, the Spirit saves. But we are saved through the word of God that he brought to man. <coughs> then number 13. The Spirit indwells man. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 here. Verses 18 and 19. Paul gives some very wise advice here that a lot of people need to hear. And be not drunk with wine. Well, we've got a lot of people that need to hear that, don't we? Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I certainly don't believe this is the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit here because it's a command, it's not a promise. They were to be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We'll go over to Colossians 3.16. We see that the Word of God indwells man. Paul said, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So when the Word of Christ, the Word of God, is dwelling in us, and we are obeying it, and we're allowing it to dwell in us and rule our lives, then the Spirit is dwelling in us. Well, friends, tonight we want to conclude our lesson and I believe that these scriptures will help to enlighten us as to the work of the Spirit and how it works. And so many today are confused about this whole thing. Of course, we have people out there that need to obey the gospel. Tonight, we know that we need to get the message out to them that they might hear the powerful word brought by the Holy Spirit down from heaven. That they might hear and believe, Romans 10, 17. Oh, how thankful we should be to God for all that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have done for us and continues to do for us and will do. We should be ever so thankful for all that God does. In hearing and believing, we are to repent as the Pentecostal Jews were commanded in Acts 2.38. Confess Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as the Ethiopian nobleman did in Acts 8.37. And then be baptized in the precious name of our Lord for the remission of sin. If any have done that, we need to return tonight and repent and pray God's forgiveness. Acts 8.20-24. We encourage you to come while we stand.